Welcome to the latest ASEAN News and here are the compilation for today with me, Vanessa. Delegation of the Pillars of the ASEAN Sociocultural Community visits Timor-Leste for three days. Timor-Leste is pleased to welcome the delegation of the ASEAN Sociocultural Community Fact-Finding Mission Delegation for three-day visit start from 6 to 8 July 2022. The purpose of the visit is to explore and assess Timor-Leste's technical readiness as well as observe the real conditions in the field regarding social and cultural issues in order for Timor-Leste to join ASEAN. Dr. Lee Kamboli from Cambodia led the Senior Officials Committee for the ASEAN Sociocultural Community SOCA, and the delegation is consist of officials from all ASEAN member states, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN for Sociocultural Community, the Committee of Permanent Representatives, and the ASEAN Secretariat. The ASEAN Fact-Finding Mission Delegation was divided into four groups to visit the various areas in Timor-Leste, such as school, university, media station, non-governmental organization, international organizations, religious institution, sports facility, state hospital, as well as private institution. The delegates consist of countries namely Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Brunei Darussalam, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, and representatives of the ASEAN Secretariat. Timor-Leste established its diplomatic missions in all ASEAN member countries, and the cooperation of Timor-Leste with the ASEAN countries has begun since 2005. The head of the sociocultural community team of ASEAN fact-finding mission, the Kambale, admired with the advanced facility of chairman. During the one-hour visit to the one of Timor-Leste's private-owned broadcasting company, the Grupo Media Nacional Television, or GMN, in Bebora Dili, Timor-Leste, the chairman of the delegation ASEAN Sociocultural Community Fact-Finding Mission, Dr. D. Kamboli, impressed with the advanced facility of GMN TV. D. Kamboli also adds that GMN has an integral part for Timor-Leste's proposal to become the member of ASEAN. The first one, as I mentioned, is Bijan our expectation before we came here. The second one, when we enter your station, especially when we enter this room, we feel like we are in the developed world. It's so modern. <laughs> the faculty. And my third impression, your work, your achievement, play an integral part for the Morris-A ASEAN Championship application. You know, this kind of private sector contribution to the country is very important. To be part of ASEAN, there are certain requirements, uh, level of requirement, and also level of degrees of facility. Then this Media group play an integral role. One of an integral, uh, one of the integral roles for the Boris Day application for the accession and to ASEAN membership. Furthermore, Chairman of the Board of Directors of GMN, Jorge Manuel de Araujo Serrano, expresses his gratitude for the appreciation by the Chair of the ASEAN Fact-Finding Mission Delegation after seeing the breakthrough of GMN TV. And he adds the importance of the media sector in the process of Timor-Leste's accession to ASEAN. They came and see by their own eyes, and while visiting, they have also expressed how advanced the facility that GMN have, as well as how the news produced. They have walked into studios and said Germany is moving forward ahead compared to other country. That's what they have expressed, not mine. It really is a privilege from media side. We have done our effort, and as a Timorese contributes to the country's development, so that we can take part in ASEAN community. The Asian fact-finding mission delegation arrived at the GMN TV premises at 4 p.m. local time and welcomed by the chairman of the board of the directors, accompanied by heads of departments and staffs. The aim of ASEAN Sociocultural Community Fact-Finding Mission in visiting Timor-Leste is to assess and explore Timor-Leste's technical readiness in the sociocultural field as the conditions for Timor-Leste's accession to ASEAN. 
Grupo Media Nacional Television is a Timorese private owned broadcasting company and it's established in July 15, 2017. Nara police identify suspect who shot former Japanese Prime Minister. Nara police says the suspected who killed Shinzo Abe, identified as 41-year-old Tetsuya Yamagami, admitted shooting the former Japanese Prime Minister. The suspect confessed that he committed the act as he had grudged against a specific organization and believed former Prime Minister Abe was part of it. We would like to refrain from getting into details. Police also says the weapon used to shoot Abe appeared to be a handmade gun, adding that several other similar ones were found while searching the suspect's apartment. Police says the suspect was an Ara resident and had worked at the Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Forces for three years but now appeared to be unemployed. Police says they were investigating whether he had acted alone. The Indonesian Foreign Minister expresses her condolences for the death of the former Prime Minister of Japan after being shot. Colleagues from the media, thank you. Indonesian Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi extends condolences to the government and people of Japan following the passing of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. I wish to extend our deepest sympathy and condolences from the government and the people of the Republic of Indonesia to the government and the people of Japan at this time of sorrow. His dedication to serving his country and people will always be remembered as a prime example for all. Abe, Japan's longest serving leader, died on Friday hours after he was shot while campaigning for a parliamentary election, shocking a country in which political violence is rare and guns are tightly controlled. It was the first assassination of a sitting or former Japanese premier since the days of pre-war militarism in the 1930s. The hospital that tried to save him said he died at 3 past 5 p.m. local time, about five and a half hours after he was shot. A doctor says Abe had bled to death from two deep wounds one on the right side of his neck. He had no vital signs when he was brought in. Papua New Guinea holds parliamentary election. Papua New Guinea holds a general election to elect the members of the national parliament on July 4th as police mounted a major security operation in an effort to stop a repeat of violence that saw more than 200 people killed during the Pacific Island nation's last election five years ago. Voting will take place from July 4 to 22 with ballots are lifted to remote constituencies with assistance from the Australian Defence Force. Papua New Guinea democracy is not easy to police and maintain the challenges always at campaign, the challenges always in the system that should support the election today for Hela uh, was a little bit dismayed. It was the first time women separated from men in voting queues to help them feel safe while voting. If the main folk are here, we'd be scared, but ladies are here so we feel comfortable. The two main contenders for Prime Minister in the 10th election since independence are incumbent Prime Minister James Marape of the Pangu Party and former Prime Minister Peter O'Neill of the People's National Congress Party. Marape became Prime Minister in 2019 after O'Neill resigned amid unhappiness at the ending of gas deal in the resource-rich but poverty-stricken country. Hearing impaired students take religious lessons in sign language. As hearing impaired students memorize and recite the Islamic holy scripture of Quran in sign language, a demography often forgotten in the world's largest Muslim population. Deaf students in Indonesia who previously could not access basic religious education, such as reading and quoting holy books, now able to learn the Quran in sign language in Yogyakarta. Religious teacher Abu Kafi opened the Darul Asom school in 2019, concerns about hearing impaired children who were marginalized from public school curriculum. Karena 
pondok seperti ini masih jarang. Because boarding schools like this are still very rare, and you could say this is the only one in Indonesia. The news of its existence quickly spread, and people really needed a place like this for hearing impaired children to study. Tempat berdaya seperti ini untuk menarung. Students remark how the boarding schools provides them with a chance to mingle with other hearing impaired peers as well as support their dreams of becoming religious teachers. One parent of a hearing impaired student at school, Fitri Andriani, was appreciative of the efforts to lessen these obstacles. Anak-anak Islam Muslim ya bisa bisa paham tentang uh, Al Quran itu bagaimana. Seperti itu sangat bagus sih pak istilahnya apalagi kalau apa ya mendukung dengan sekolah formalnya lagi kira -kira baik. School now has 12 staff and teaches 115 students aged between the age of 7 and 28. In Indonesia, the curriculum in public schools only provides limited religious teaching to children with special needs starting at the age of 8 or 9 rather than a kindergarten for many other students. According to the survey by the United Nations Children Agency for UNICEF, only 3 out of 10 children with disabilities in Indonesia are able to go to school. Hearing impaired students typically spend about 5 years to learn and recite and memorize the Quran at the school. China's United Nations envoy calls on all sides to peacefully solve Ukraine crisis. Chinese prominent representative to the United Nations, Zhang Jun, calls for joint efforts of all sides to achieve a peaceful settlement of Ukraine crisis. Facts have fully proved that arms delivery cannot bring peace and sanctions and pressure cannot resolve the security dilemma. Weaponizing the world's economy and coercing other countries to take sides will only create divisions in the international community and make the world more unstable. At the UN Security Council meeting on the Ukrainian situation, Zhang pointed out that NATO is making troubles around the world and the obsolete Cold War script can't be staged again in the Asia-Pacific region. Zhang says all sides of the international community should work for an early settlement of the Ukraine crisis in a responsible manner and create the necessary environment and conditions for peaceful negotiations between the parties concerned. Zhang says, expanding military alliances to seek one's own security at the expense of others will inevitably lead to a security dilemma. He points out that it is a lesson deserving serious reflection that NATO's five East to war expansions to the East have not made Europe safer but instead sown the seeds of conflict. Zhang warns that the outdated call towards grip must not be put on again in the Asia-Pacific region. China and Cambodia agree to enhance cooperation in various fields. Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Cambodian Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Prak Sokon meet in Bagan, Myanmar, and both sides pledged to further enhance relations and cooperation in building the Belt and Road and other fields. They meet on the sidelines of the 7th Lanjang Mekong Cooperation Minister's meeting. China is willing to work with Cambodia to further implement the strategic consensus reached between their leaderships, strengthen communication, and deepen cooperation so as to do a good job in solidifying the China-Cambodian community with a shared future, and to celebrate the 65th anniversary of bilateral diplomatic ties in 2023 with more visible results. Meanwhile, Cambodia says will continue to firmly adhere to the One China policy and support China's stance on issues concerning Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang. Cambodia hopes to maintain high-level exchanges and strengthen strategic communication with China and celebrate the 65th anniversary of bilateral diplomatic ties in 2023 with more cooperation achievements. They also agreed to continue cooperation in fields including anti-pandemic, agriculture, environmental protection, technology and cultural, and people-to-people -people exchanges. The two sides also held in-depth discussion on Chinese relations with the ASEAN. Sokong stresses Cambodia is willing to work with China to safeguard the peace, stability and prosperity of this region. The two sides also exchange views on issues related to Myanmar, the South China Sea and the Lanchang Mekong Cooperation. Prak Sokong also the Special Envoy of the ASEAN for Myanmar.
China hopes to work together with ASEAN to push Myanmar in the start of democratic transition process and exploration of a path of political development with Myanmar's own characteristics that also suits international conditions. South Korean's whole anti tat protest near presidential office. South Korean residents and peace activists who had protested against the deployment of the U.S. Terminal Height Altitude Area Defense TAT rallied once again near the presidential office in Yongsun District in central Seoul. Around hundreds of people for anti-TAT association told a press conference that all the procedures of the U.S. missile shield deployment have been abnormal and illegal given the deployment decision without consent from residents and the parliament the absence of environmental impact assessment, and the operation and the site construction under the name of temporary deployment. The government of President Yoon suk yeol who took office recently, decided to speed up normalization of the TAT deployment site by ordering the transportation of construction materials into the site and launching the environmental impact assessment in efforts to push for formal deployment of the United States missile defense system on the Korean peninsula. The residents and activists say formal TAT deployment under the name of normalization will jeopardize the daily life of residents, undermine peace on the Korean Peninsula and the Northeast Asia. The protesters raised placards near the presidential office that say stop construction for formal TAT deployment that aims to build a military alliance between South Korea, United States and Japan. United Nations investigators say South Korean violated rights of deported North Korean fishermen. After prosecutors reopened the case, a United Nations says South Korea's 2019 decision to deport without legal process two North Korean fishermen suspected of murdering their shipmates violated human rights principles. And these are extremely dramatic cases because once a person... United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in North Korea, Thomas Ojea Quintana says, while the fate of the two men is unconfirmed, there was an expectation their rights would be violated when they were turned over to North Korean authorities and therefore Seoul had an obligation to process them in South Korean justice system rather than immediately repatriate them. Former President Moon Jae-in's administration deported the fishermen, describing them dangerous criminals who killed 16 other colleagues aboard their vessels while crossing the sea border and said they would cause harm if they were accepted in South Korean society. Well, that's the end for today's episode. We will see you again soon. Have a lovely day.